If you've just been bitten by a snake, here are the steps to follow to ensure you'll be okay. Step number one, stay calm. Out of all of these, this is gonna be the most difficult because obviously you've just been bitten by a snake. But what we're trying to do is keep our blood flow down to prevent the spread of the venom anymore into our bloodstream. So stay calm. Step number two is to immobilize the extremity where you were bitten. By doing this, again, we're trying to reduce the blood flow in that area, thus preventing the circulation of the venom in our bloodstream. Step number three, call 911. At this point, once you've gotten calm, you've got your extremity immobilized, you'll want to talk to them and obviously discuss next steps. But again, we want to stay calm leading up to this moment. The next step is to keep the area that was bitten by a snake at level with our heart or below the heart. The next step is to clean the womb with soapy water. If there's any venom left over on the outside, we don't want that to get any more into deep tissue. Next, you want to stay hydrated. Drink plenty of water. You want to avoid any type of caffeine or alcohol. And finally, do not use a tourniquet. By using a tourniquet, we keep the venom concentrated, which will only help to do more damage to the tissue. If you follow these steps, you'll be fine. Obviously, you want to get to the hospital as soon as you can to get treatment, but the steps leading up to the time before you go to the hospital will be very important. Having gotten that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bones and Nurse Amy. They're a regular on this YouTube channel, and they bring a lot of knowledge and experience from their medical background to this community. I recently reached out to them and asked if they'd be willing to do a video specifically addressing the issue of venomous snake bites, both when there are medical facilities available and when there are not. So if you'd like to check out their YouTube channel, I'll post a link in the cards up above and in the description section below. Enjoy the video. Hey, this looks like a pretty good spot over here. I can see some fish right here. Joe, watch out. Hey, ow! What, what, the, what the hell was that? <sighs> I think you got bitten by a snake. Oh, God darn it. Oh, crap, where is it? Do you see it? I think it's swimming off over there. I can't see it anymore. Uh, what color was it? Uh, I think it was black. Black. Uh, anything else? I don't know. Well, it opened its mouth for a second. Looks sort of whitish inside. Uh, must be a cotton mouth. That's no good. Uh, wow, that burns. Well, here's the bite. It looks like two fang marks. Typical venomous snake bite pattern. Now, sometimes you might see only one, so it's not always looking like that. Non-venomous snake bites, well, they look like rows of smaller marks. Now, okay, I probably got bitten by a water moccasin, also known as cottonmouth. Where I got bit is pretty common. It's usually the ankle, the foot, the lower leg, or the hand or forearm. Now, what do I need to do? In normal times, well, I have someone call 911 or get to the hospital as soon as possible. Now, if no one's coming, you have to calmly get out of there. Now that's the key, you should stay calm. Freaking out just drives the venom more quickly through your system. Stay as still as possible, if the snake is at the road that is, if the snake is still right there, well, take evasive action, take note of what it looks like, or maybe take a pic if you have time, but get out of the immediate area. Should you raise lower or keep your leg level with the heart? Different experts recommend different positions. Emergency specialist Dr. Tim Erickson says to raise the leg. Survival expert Dave Canterbury says to keep the leg level with the heart. And the CDC recommends a little lower than the heart. Now I would keep it at or below the level of the heart. And I'll explain why later. I want to get to the hospital right away, even if I don't feel so bad right at the moment. It may take a while for symptoms to show up. Although burning is probably something that you'll feel immediately and it'll start climbing up the leg. Hospitals have something called Crofab, which is an anti-venom that works with pit viper bites like the one I just got. Now, if possible, I would wash the bite area with soap and water and cover it with a clean, dry dressing. It's also important to stay hydrated. That's really important. I would not do, however, any of the following. I wouldn't go after the snake or try to kill it. I wouldn't apply a tourniquet to the wound. I wouldn't slash the wound with a knife and suck out the venom. And I wouldn't apply ice to the injury, even though it might begin to swell. I would avoid alcohol and caffeinated beverages. And I'll tell you, I would not bother with commercial snake bite kits. I'll tell you why later. 
Wrapping the injury, well, it seems to be more useful with other species like coral snakes. Dave Canterbury suggests placing a splint for immobilization. I think that's a better idea than a pressure dressing, at least in pit viper bites. I'll give you reasons again for all this later. It's possible that I've got a dry bite. It'll still hurt, but the amount of bruising and other symptoms will be much less. That's a minority of pit viper bites though, so watch carefully if you can't get to medical help. Use a marker to see how the borders of the swelling and the bruising spread or don't spread over the course of time. It might take several hours in some cases for the full effect to become apparent. I might have saved myself all this if I had worn my wading boots or at least high tops and long pants. And certainly if I were a little more aware of where I was stepping. The good news is that only five people died out of several thousand venomous snake bites last year in the U.S. The bad news is that severe problems occur more often in elderly folks like me, as well as the very young. I've got a lot more to say about this, but I'm a little busy right now. Should have stayed in my rocking chair today for sure. There they are. See you later. I hope. Hi again, Joe Alton, MD here, also known as Dr. Bones of the survival medicine website doomandbloom.net. Okay, so I faked the cotton mouth bite. Cut me a little bit of slack here. Of the 3,000 species of snakes on planet Earth, only about 400 are venomous. In North America, those that inject venom into their victims are either pit vipers or elipids. The pit vipers include species of rattlesnakes, water moccasins, also known as cottonmouths, and copperheads. One species or another exists everywhere in the U.S. except for Maine, Alaska, and Hawaii. Elipids include coral snakes found mostly in the south. A word about venom. Notice that I don't say poison when I talk about these kinds of snakes. Poisons are absorbed in the gut or through the skin, but venom must be injected into tissues or blood via fangs or a stinger. Strange to say, but it's usually not dangerous to drink snake venom unless you happen to have a cut or sore in your mouth. Now, having said that, please don't try this at home. Let's talk about pit vipers. Pit vipers account for most snake bites in North America. The pit refers to heat sensing organs located between the eye and the nostril on each side of a triangular shaped head. The eyes have slit like pupils. Of all pit vipers, rattlesnakes contribute the most to snake bite statistics in the United States. They get their name from a structure at the end of their tails, which makes a loud, well, rattling sound when shaken. The rattle serves as a warning to discourage nearby threats. Copperheads look very similar to a rattlesnake, but without the rattle. As the name suggests, it's often copper colored or pinkish tan with darker bands. Water moccasins are very comfortable, well, in water. The snake has no rattle. And so it's relatively silent, as if it's walking in moccasins. That's why it's called a water moccasin. Its response to threats is opening its mouth wide and exposing its whitish oral cavity before biting. And that behavior gives it the nickname cottonmouth. The water moccasin may have a pattern when young, but as an adult is almost black in color. Its thick body differentiates it from other water snakes. Most water snakes tend to be sort of slender. Let's talk about elipids. Elipids, like coral snakes, are related to the king cobra. They're like cobras. They're brightly colored but unassuming creatures that are rarely aggressive, unlike some of their cousins. Their small fangs are just less effective in delivering venom than, let's say, pit vipers. A coral snake tends to hold on and chew on its victim rather than striking and letting go like the vipers do. As I mentioned earlier, venomous snake bites have a distinct appearance due to the hollow fangs in the corner of the mouth. Looks sort of like this. And this differs from non-venomous snakes where the bites have sort of a more uniform appearance. Now, not every bite from a venomous snake transmits toxins to the victim. Indeed, 25 to 30 percent of these bites are going to be dry, what we call dry, and seem no worse than a bee sting. This could be due to the short duration of time that a snake maybe had its fangs in its victim or whether the snake had bitten another animal just shortly beforehand. In a venomous bite, a painful burning sensation occurs almost immediately. Swelling at the site may begin as soon as five minutes afterwards and may travel up the affected area towards the body core. You might be surprised to learn that snake venom injected into soft tissue mostly travels through the body via the lymphatic system, not the blood. That's why it may take a while to see the full effect. 
Pit viper bites are hemotoxic, meaning that they tend to cause bruising and blisters at the site of the wound. Numbness may be noted in the area bitten or perhaps on the lip or face. Some victims notice a metallic or other strange taste in their mouths. Serious bites might cause spontaneous bleeding from the nose and gums, irregular heart rhythms, or difficulty breathing. The soft tissue in the area of the bite is commonly seen to deteriorate, a process called necrosis, something more common in water moccasin bites. Coral snake bites, however, are neurotoxic, not hemotoxic, neurotoxic, and will cause mental and nerve issues such as twitching, confusion, and slurred speech. Later, nerve damage may cause difficulty with swallowing or breathing, and indeed, it may follow with total paralysis. Luckily, there are much fewer coral snake bites than pit viper bites in the United States. An ounce of prevention, they say, is worth a pound of cure. High top boots and long pants are always a sound strategy when hiking in the wilderness. It's important to be aware of where you're putting your hands and feet. Be especially careful around areas where snakes might like to hide, such as hollow logs, under rocks, or in old shelters. Wearing sturdy work gloves, not a bad idea. Good precaution if you can't avoid these places. If you let snakes know you're near, they tend to leave the area. Snakes have no outer ears, so treading heavily creates ground vibrations more easily heard by them than, say, shouting. Some snakes like to be active at night, especially in hot weather. That means that outdoor activities at that time are best done with a really good light source. The standard treatment for a venomous snake bite is antivenin, something capable of neutralizing a specific toxin. And urgent care centers, well, they might not have it, but most hospitals will. The quantity given is often the same for children and adults, as you're treating the venom, not the patient. In severe envenomation cases, several injections might be needed. Now that's great, but in survival scenarios, this product is going to be a scarce commodity. If there's no help coming, follow steps similar to the actions I took at the beginning of this video. Keep the victim calm. Stress increases blood flow, thereby endangering the patient by spreading the venom into the system. Stop all movement of the injured extremity. Movement transports venom into the circulation faster, so do your best to keep the limb still. Clean the wound thoroughly to remove any venom that isn't yet deep in the wound. You want to also remove rings, bracelets, and anklets from affected extremities. Swelling is likely to occur. You want to keep your victim hydrated. By the way, in coral snake bites, you can indeed wrap with bandages looser than a pressure dressing but farther up the limb. This is not usually done with pit viper bites. And similarly, I want you to avoid the use of tourniquets in these situations, which do more harm than good by concentrating the venom in the area of the bite. It causes a lot of local damage. Draw a circle around the affected area. This, I think, is a great idea. Get yourself a marker and draw a circle around it. As time progresses, you'll see the area shrink if it improves or grow if it worsens. By the way, this is a good strategy to follow for any local reaction, soft tissue infection, abscess, or even a hematoma, collection of blood. The limb should then be rested and, if needed, immobilized with a sling or a splint. The less movement there is, the better. You should keep your patient on bed rest with the bite site at or lower than the level of the heart for about 24 to 48 hours. Too high and venom spreads more quickly. Below the level increases perhaps the risk of local damage at the level of the heart. Well, I guess either may happen. 12 hours without any major symptoms, you're probably okay. This strategy also works, by the way, from venomous lizards like Gila monsters. It's no longer recommended to make an incision and try to suck out the venom with your mouth. The amount of venom removed is thought to be very little, and oral bacteria could certainly introduce an infection. Snake bite kits are available for your backpack, but they're out of favor with most wilderness medical professionals. We just don't use them. The Sawyer Extractor, which is a syringe with a suction cup, it's modern and compact, but it's ineffective in eliminating more than a very small fraction of the venom. There are a number of natural remedies that work well with insect venom, but have less hard data that they do anything for snakes. Plantain, for example, chewed and then applied to the bite wound, is suggested by Dave Canterbury, and if there's no antivenom, well, it probably can't hurt. 
You may wonder why I haven't suggested antibiotics as a treatment for snake bite. Interestingly enough, snake bites don't cause infections as frequently as bites from, let's say, cats, dogs, or humans. As such, antibiotics are used a little less often. Water moccasin bites, I would say, are an exception. You should realize that a snake doesn't always slither away after it bites you. It's likely that it still has more venom that it can inject, so move out of its territory or abolish the threat in any way you can. Killing the snake may not render it harmless, however. It can reflexively bite for a period of time. Elipids and pit vipers may respond differently to an encounter with a human. Coral snakes are not as aggressive as pit vipers. They prefer fleeing to attacking. Once they bite you, however, they tend to hold on. Rattlesnakes prefer to bite and let go quickly, but unlike elipids, well, they may be reluctant to relinquish their territory to you, so leave the area as soon as you can. Snakes can be dangerous, but they want to avoid you as much as you want to avoid them. Most snake bites are the fault of an unwary victim or somebody actively trying to handle or otherwise disturb the animal. Keep an eye out, wear decent gear, and both you and the snake can coexist in the great outdoors.